Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we are going to be reading True Let's Not Meet Stories, but with a slight twist from our usual content. Recently, I had to revisit my channel and make some adjustments to ensure that it complies with YouTube standards. This meant going back through my older videos, identifying content that didn't quite fit the bill for one reason or another, and reworking it to meet those guidelines. During this process, I revisited those vintage videos and diligently removed any content that might raise YouTube's eyebrows. Moreover, I undertook the task of enhancing the audio quality for your listening pleasure. We will still have new videos with new stories every week, but I do want to preserve as much as I can of those old videos and re-release them as I am able to do so. Also, while making those videos much longer than they originally were, by combining two or three of the videos together, I genuinely hope that you enjoy them. So now, without further ado, lay back relax, and enjoy these true, scary stories. I read a post earlier tonight that reminded me of this not-so-fun moment that happened last year. At the time, I, 24-year-old female, had the entire lower main floor unit I lived in to myself. I used to bartend slash manage a nightclub a few blocks away and would usually get home around 4 a.m. This night, I had just finished a 12-hour shift, was exhausted and hungry, so I decided to order some food. I placed the order, get my joint rolled and ready for when the food arrives, put on a movie and wait. Eventually, I hear the doorbell ring and being alone and it being late at night, I waited to get the photo sent to the delivery app to verify my food was at the door, and so I didn't have to make small talk with the driver as post-COVID I still kept the option for contactless delivery. Three to five minutes pass. I see the photo of my food on the doorstep and decide to get up and go get it. My bedroom window had five large windows that gave my full view of the path along the house, the main street in front, our garbage area, and the area right in front of our unit's door. The driver is still out there, and now he's texting me to come out and get my food. I tell him he left it in a perfect spot. I'll be out shortly to get it, and thanks for delivering it. At this point, I'm waiting for him to go, because even though marijuana is legal here, people can still be judgmental, and I don't want to go out in my PJs to collect my food, smoke, and see a human after working all night. He doesn't leave. He keeps texting me to come outside, and now I can hear him talking to another male voice although my window view obscures anyone else that might be out there. The food in the photo was right against my door, and I can see him edging it away and off to the side, so I'd have to fully step out and around a small corner to collect it. I keep texting him, telling him it's in a perfect spot. I'm glad he followed the instructions. I'll be out shortly. He starts banging on my front door, still occasionally talking to this other male voice. My food is now further away from the door, he won't stop banging and telling me to come outside. Eventually, I tell him I set delivery as no contact as I have COVID, which was a lie, and don't want to get anyone sick. After I saw he'd read my message on the app, he put my food back by the front door and walked out of there, through the back parking lot. Initially, he'd come in through the front of the house. Something about this entire encounter felt so off. I waited about 15 minutes until I couldn't see anyone or hear anyone quickly open the door and grab my food. The whole ordeal lasted about an hour. My food was nice and cold. The joint was put away for another day, and my heart was racing for the rest of the night. So, delivery man who would not take the hint and go away back to his friend? Let's not meet. This just happened today, and it's got to be quite long. Maybe when you read it, it'll seem like nothing, and it has a good ending, but I've never been so scared in my life, and I need to share it. 
I'm a social work student doing an internship at a mental institution. It's not like other hospitals. It's organized like a village with care houses for people who have different pathologies and did different things, ranging from murdering people, serial assault, to people who have deficiencies and are considered harmless. There are closed and open units. It's in a remote town outside of the city I live in, and there are woods everywhere in the village. This patient in question is considered harmless, even though he essayed a nurse and another patient a few years back, and he has deviant tendencies. Thing is, he's in an open unit and free of his movements and can go out whenever he wants. Today, he came multiple times by the unit I was working in because he wanted a football magazine we didn't have, and we had to lock ourselves in because he was screaming and was hitting against the door. At one point, he got yelled at by a colleague and started crying like a baby and ran away. It honestly made me feel so sad for him. He's in his late 20s, but he acts and talks like a child and has been here since his teenage years. My co-workers warned me and told me what to answer if I ever got face to face with him in order to not make him aggressive. So, ended work a little bit late this evening and it was already night out. It was only me and my tutor left in the unit and I had to leave by myself because she wanted to work a bit longer. So I go out, take the usual route, the shortest way out going through a small wooded area. There is absolutely no one out. I walk for a few minutes and suddenly I hear someone running full speed behind me. I turn around and it's him. My heart stopped for a second. He then stops and gets very close to me, starts asking me questions. If I have a boyfriend, if I'm Algerian, if I like football, what team do I support? And several times if I find him handsome. I respond positively to all of his questions like I was told to do. But I see he's not satisfied and is getting irritated and he's getting even closer, blocking my way. At that point, I think that's it. I'm alone at night here with this guy who's already assaulted people. And now it's going to be my turn, if not worse. I was told to always go his way. So at that point... I think my only option is to make him calmer by talking about something he likes. So I start talking football with him for a good few minutes. I start to see him in a better mood, and I think now is my chance. I tell him I really need to go, which he doesn't seem to agree with at first, but finally I manage to get away. I walk as fast as I can to exit out of the hospital. At one point I look back to see he's not there anymore, and I felt so relieved. At the end, I don't know what his intentions were, if I managed to get out from something really bad, or if he just wanted someone to talk to, but he really scared me anyways. Thank you to anyone who read that. Thank you. This happened a few years ago. I'm a 28-year-old female, and I was on my way to the BMV before work. For some context, we have two major streets, Lane Avenue and Park Avenue, in our city with many residential streets that intersected both avenues. I was headed south from Lane to Park Avenue. My destination was on Park. On one of the intersecting streets, when a woman, about 22 years old, ran out in front of my truck. My truck was an old Ford that did not have automatic locks. I had barely stopped when she hopped into my truck, not even asking through my window for a ride or help. She got in and I told her to get out. She said she was diabetic and it was her birthday and begged me to go back the opposite direction to her home. I told her no, I had to go to work. She said her boyfriend beat her up. She had not a single scratch or bruise, but I asked if she needed an ambulance anyways. It was 90 degrees outside, and she claimed to be having a diabetic episode, and she begged me not to call. After a few minutes of her arguing, begging, and pleading with me, and me saying no, I finally and forcefully told her that I wasn't moving until she got the F out of my truck. At this point, she opened the door and jumped out. I started to drive away as soon as her feet hit the ground. She slammed the door shut and yelled through my window, Oh yeah? Well, I've just been stabbed. And when I looked in the rear view, she was waiting in the road for the next car. I called 911 and told them what had happened and where she was. 
I knew if she was truly diabetic in the 90 plus degree weather without food or water, she could become delusional very quickly. That every instinct in my body tells me she had more sinister intentions, especially living on one of the human trafficking hubs of the country. I don't know what fate I could have met had I taken her to wherever her supposed destination was. Girl that hopped in my truck, let's never meet again. I am 33 now, so this was a long time ago. I only remember parts of it, but my mom said it was the most terrified she had ever been in her entire life. Rightfully so. As a kid, I had a problem with wandering off. I still do this as an adult, and it's usually caused by something grabbing my attention, and I just disappear from a group sometimes. It's a joke now, but when I was a kid, it was incredibly dangerous. I would find out 15 years later that this was my undiagnosed ADHD kicking in. My family went to a park one afternoon. It was a beautiful day, and my mom and dad had a picnic on the grass and were drinking some wine. My siblings and I were off in the field playing. At some point, I saw an old man sitting on a bench. He wasn't looking at us or bothering us, but my ADHD brain decided to go say hello for some reason. In addition to wandering off, I also had a knack for talking to strangers. I'm surprised I'm still alive, to be honest. I remember this old man seemed nice and showed me a magic trick. The old coin behind the ear thing. I thought it was cool, and he showed me a couple more tricks. This is where my memory blanks until my mom ended up finding me. At some point, my mom noticed I was missing. She knew I had an issue for wandering off, but the fact I couldn't be seen in an open park was alarming. She so searched for about five minutes and could not find me. Eventually, she did find me, with this old man, standing in between two cars in the parking lot. I don't remember how I got there, or why I went there, but I do remember my mom swooping me away from the man and freaking the hell out. My dad ended up punching the guy, I think. From what my mom said, no foul play was apparent when she found me. He just looked like a quiet old man in his 60s. But the fact that I was in between two cars probably meant that I was seconds away from getting abducted if my mom didn't find me in time. So yeah, don't let your overly friendly ADHD kids talk to strangers. Bonus. One other time, two years later, I wandered off in Disney World. I was just playing in Goofy's house, but apparently I was missing for like 30 minutes. Nothing bad happened, and I had no idea what I was doing was wrong but my parents and my grandparents basically had a heart attack searching for me. Clearly, I am the sole reason that they all have gray hair now. I grew up out in the wooded country in Illinois, on a short dead-end street 10 plus miles from a town. And there were seven houses in the area spread out on two and a half acres of wooded lots. There were no large wild animals. There aren't bears or similarly large animals in the region. And people didn't meander there or show up lost. Usually lost folks or large animals wandering around never happened in the 20 years I lived there. So please keep that in mind. When I was a young girl in my early teens, I had a good guy friend a few years older than me who lived next door, Terry. Terry was allowed to go out with his friends much later than I was, and he would sometimes tromp over to my yard after getting home late and throw rocks from the gravel area outside my window to chat. The bed was right next to the window. I'd open the window and we'd whisper stories and generally talk for a bit. My second story window faced our backyard and his house was to the side. I could see his house from my window over the shrub trees and the walking path to his driveway. I'd often know if he was out, the light was on over the side of door entrance, or already home. Light was off. One time during the summer, when my window was open, I heard a car in his driveway dropping him off. I was probably 14 years old, and it was around midnight. I heard Terry get out of a car, and he was talking to his friends. Soon, his friends pulled away. I softly called out as loud as I could without waking my parents, asking Terry to stop by and chat. 
he didn't respond as he probably didn't hear me. Then I came up with the not so brilliant idea to sneak outside and scare him. I'd spent many years in the woods and learning how to blend in and be silent. As kids, we'd often sneak around and scare each other. So I silently sneaked down from the second floor and out my back garage door, which led to our backyard below my window, which led to Terry's house off the side through our gravel area. Then through a well-worn path through the woods about 25 feet long. My parents had put in a gravel pit around the back of the house, probably because nothing much grew due to the shade of the oak trees. There were 14-inch oaks set out as an uneven stepping path on the gravel, and if you stepped off the rounds, the crunch of the gravel rocks would give you away. I picked my way expertly and silently across the log rounds facing Terry's house. My eyes got accustomed to the dark and I didn't see him. Also, at that time, I heard the door of his house close and the light going off signaling he went in, likely to bed. I waited a bit as I thought I saw something move in the woods between our houses, but not on the path we'd always use. If he didn't use the path, there were wild rose and raspberry plants that had thorns and were painful to walk through if you weren't careful. So I thought it was odd that he'd be in the woods, but maybe he wanted to scare me like I was plotting to do to him. But I saw something human-sized and dark, moving through the woods, slow, and pausing every once in a while like me. It was coming closer, and I definitely saw it, but it was strange that it wasn't walking directly to my window to talk. Therefore, I hunched down and waited in silence, wondering if I could still startle him. I still thought it was Terry, and he saw me sneak out, and he was trying to scare me. I watched a dark outline of a human figure moving, but then I would lose sight of it in the foliage. It seemed to be stalking slowly and listening slash checking every few feet while hiding. So I whispered after losing patience one last time for Terry, but he didn't answer. I got bored of hiding and crouching, so I quietly tippy-toed back to my garage door and went back inside, silently locking up as I went. I snuck back upstairs to my room above the area where I was just standing slash crouching. My window was open and I definitely heard someone slash something walking around the yard. I whispered again for Terry out my window but got no answer. Then I heard someone slash something fall and grunt slash moan pretty loudly in the window well right below my window. It wasn't enough to wake my parents but definitely loud enough I didn't mistake it and it sent a shock of fear through me. If you aren't familiar with a window well, it's a semicircle hole connected to the house dug out about three or four feet deep and reinforced with metal. It allows a basement window to be put in below ground level, and the hole lets some natural light in. There is no way Terry would have fallen into our window well. We had been playing hide and seek and many outdoor games for years since we were young around the whole neighborhood. We knew everyone's window wells and house footprints, plus paths in the woods, like the back of our hands. The grunt sounded humanish and not like an animal. It also pulled itself out quietly without a lot of thrashing. That's when I realized this wasn't a fun game, and someone slash something was out there, and it wasn't Terry. I tried to look outside my window as best as I could, but there was a screen on my windows to keep the bugs out, so I couldn't lean my head out the window to see next to the wall of our house directly below me. I then heard the crunch of rocks, as whatever it was stepping away in the noisy gravel. Again, Terry would know where the log rounds were, and would not step in the gravel. He knew my parents were pretty strict, and he was as good at being quiet as I was. Whatever it was, stopped, and I held my breath. I pretty much sat there with my face pressed against the screen two stories up for probably half an hour. It seemed like an hour, but I'm sure I didn't have the patience back then to wait that long. I never heard it slash him slash her leave, but I grew tired and eventually fell asleep on my bed that was next to my window. There are a few things that I am certain of. One, it wasn't Terry. I asked him later and he said he went to bed that night when he got home. He also would have no reason to lie. Two, I'm pretty sure it wasn't one of our neighbors and I can't think of any reason a person would be there. We had a few neighbors and only two other houses out of seven had kids. Again, these seven houses were spread out in two and a half acres per home. Three, there weren't any big animals in the area. As wooded as the whole area was, we only had some deer, but they were hunted and didn't come close to homes. Plus, our dogs scared them away. So, 
stranger in the woods. Let's not ever meet. Content warning for misogynistic language, threats of violence, and minor actual violence. Shoving. Stay safe out there, everybody. Before I skipped a year, I was in a class with a guy named Charlie in year two and three. I never particularly liked him. He spoke too loudly and boasted constantly. On top of that, he made fun of me for my social anxiety, my slight accent and nationality. He threw things at me occasionally, and teachers never believed me since I was shy and an imaginative young girl. When I skipped a year and moved to a different campus of the same private school, I was sure that I wouldn't see him again. I didn't. Not until last year. I was in year 10, and I am now in year 11. I do well in all classes except for art. Made a few close friends who I trust and even joined a couple of clubs. Seven-year-old me would be proud. But the terror started at the beginning of the last school year. My friend Ray was walking me to Spanish class, and behind me I hear a boy calling my name. I turned around, and surely enough, it's Charlie. He made a few jokes about me being a nerd to his friends, and Ray promptly took me around the outside of the main building to the other building where I have Spanish. He asked me about it, and I brushed it off, saying that it was just some guy who probably knew me from the other campus. Every Monday, I have MUN during lunch, and one day I was helping Patrick, the club leader, clean up and rearrange the classroom. He asked me to grab an eraser from the teacher's cupboard, and I quickly head a floor down. As I'm coming back up, I see Charlie jogging up behind me, tripping me and pushing me right into the metal railing. I wasn't severely hurt, but my foot was recovering from being fractured, so it wasn't ideal. I found him roaming the hallway with his friends, so I called out for him. He turned around, and I asked if I could just quickly say one thing to him. I began politely asking him to be careful when on the stairs, to which he rolled his eyes. But I continued to explain why he should not push me again, since my foot was healing and that overall he could hurt someone. His face morphed from annoyance to a crooked smile. Him and his friends broke out in a fit of laughter. I ignored them and began to walk towards the classroom where MUN is hosted, as him and his friends started chanting the C word over and over again. His behavior only worsened from then on. I quickly got up from my chair, leaving my laptop open when I was in the library, and he swiftly started browsing my tabs and apps, some of which were of private messages to friends and family. I returned, standing by the seat in horror, and snatched the laptop from his hands. On another occasion, he stole my sports uniform and broke my umbrella. What was worse was when he somehow got my number, and over a series of voicemails, he began detailing all the grotesque things he would do to me if I was ever alone. They started off as pretty average, beating me until I was bruised or ripping out my hair, but began to transgress into sexual violence. He said he wished he could choke me and arm me, only to leave me lying on his bed, bloodied and terrified. This was followed by remarks about how much I was asking for it through the clothes I wore, how women are stupid and deserve to be treated as such, and that no one would want me after him. I haven't had any reactions within this school year, but I remain wary. If anything escalates, I will tell my friends and family more details. But for now, at least I feel safer than I did before. Thrifting is my favorite hobby, if you can call it that. It's something I like to do alone when I get the time. It's a chance for my brain to shut off and just let go as I scan aisles, crammed with random things for hours. Note, I'm five foot five and a half, former elementary teacher. I'm about as intimidating as a wet sock, and I'm pretty quiet and stay to myself in public. I had decided to go out of my way to a store I hadn't been to before, and followed my usual routine. When I'm in a store, it's just me and the items. I don't pay any mind to anyone else around me, as the stores are crowded and I'm really only there to do my own thing. 
So imagine my surprise when an older woman turned to me and said in a huff, Can I help you? I turned and looked around me to make sure that I was who she was talking to. I just shook my head no, making a confused expression and went back to looking at shoes. Things were okay for a minute before I heard her in the next aisle talking to a friend. Oh my god, this creepy woman is following me. Every time I look up, she's there. There was only so much space in the store. I usually go along the edges and then make my way to the center of the store. So there's a good chance she probably just saw me doing my thing. I tried to avoid her until I realized she started talking to random people about me about how creepy I was and how I was stalking her. People started giving me funny looks, but paid no mind once they realized how harmless and shrimpy I look. Uh, her? Really? Someone said. Yeah, I'm going to mess her up if I see her again. She began making more and more aggressive comments, and I decided that I had had enough. I've never fought anyone in my life, and I wasn't planning to that day. I left my items and went to my car. Yeah, something was up with her, and I wasn't sticking around to find out what it was. To the actually creepy lady in the thrift store, let's not meet again. Last year, I was going out for drinks with my friends, but since I had to go to uni the next day, I only stayed till around midnight. My boyfriend promised to pick me up and go home with me, because I don't like to take the subway home at night, but since I was pretty drunk by then, I took a little too long walking out of the pub. Unfortunately, we had to wait for the night bus, with multiple stops, since the subway closes on weekdays at night. For context, my boyfriend and I don't live together but very close to each other, around 15 to 20 minutes walking distance. Both areas are pretty crappy. He lives near a train station, a lot of crackheads, homeless and sketchy people around, and I live in a cheap, bad district with a high crime rate. My building has two entrances on two different streets because it is a corner building site leading to a patio and then to the apartment building and its doors. To get into my apartment, I have to open three doors. I usually use the entrance door that is nearer to the subway and on the side of my apartment. We had to take two buses to go home. One drove us to the train station and the next one from the train station to my apartment. After getting out of the first bus, we realized that we would have to wait for around 20 minutes or something for the second bus to come. And since I really had to sleep at home, class the next day, I didn't want to stay at his place. My boyfriend didn't want to wait, so he persuaded me to walk instead of taking the bus which sober me would have never done. But since I was still drunk, I didn't care how we got home, so I agreed. So, we started walking home and passed by a few sketchy people, mostly people selling drugs, etc., but nothing really that bad. Then, I saw a guy walking on our direction, and I somehow got a bad feeling, so I told my boyfriend that I wanted to change to the other side of the street because I don't want to walk past him. Suddenly, the guy yelled, hey, as if he wanted to ask us something, but we ignored it and continued to walk. He got louder and louder until he started to yell. I could see from the corner of my eye that he was coming over, so I whispered, right, to my boyfriend, took his hand and ran the fastest I could while he was chasing us. We ran, ran, and ran, and then made a turn to the right, the street where I live, and we hid. It seemed like he was gone. So I took my keys out and we started running towards my building, taking the other entrance of my building that I normally didn't use. As I was trying to open the door, my boyfriend started panicking, throwing me inside the patio and closing the door aggressively and then pushing me to the building. He explained that the guy came running from the other side of the street, meaning he took a shortcut, probably thinking we were going to run to the subway slash bus stops. If we had taken the other entrance, he would have been clearly the faster one. Being in shock, we unfortunately didn't call the police, which I regret. I stopped going out for drinks slash clubbing for a half a year after this and slept at my boyfriend's place for two weeks because I was scared that he would come back. I think the worst thing about this is that he really wanted to get us for whatever reason. I still want to know why he chased us for so long. Two weeks later, a girl a few streets away was aard in front of her building by a guy who chased her home. I wonder if it was the same guy. 
or maybe it was just a coincidence. Either way, dude, let's not meet. This happened when I was 12 or 13. Back then, late 80s, there was a curfew for anyone under age. I don't know if that still exists, but it matters for the story. Me, female, and my best friend, female, would walk the neighborhood at night. She would spend the night a lot at my house, and me at hers, vice versa, most weekends. We would crawl through my bedroom window and walk around and visit our middle school friends or just go to the park or whatever. We were well aware of the curfew and would run and hide from headlights, as we didn't want to get caught. One night, we were out doing our thing, see some headlights, and run under a carport. The car pulls into the driveway we're hiding in. Guy gets out and starts yelling, You trying to rob me? So we run. My friend runs one way, I run the other. I hear her scream. I look back and see she's caught. She has her hands up. I realize that I can't leave her there by herself, so I walk over, with my hands up, saying it's okay, we're just kids. Then I see the man has a gun. He's pointing the gun at her, and she is hyperventilating. I walk up, trying to explain that we aren't trying to do anything crazy, just running from possible cops. He points the gun at me. He's saying something about us trying to rob him. I'm like, no, dude. We were hiding from possible cops because of curfew. He made us pull our shirts up to show supposedly that we had no weapons but we were 13 years old so thinking back he might have just been a perv he let us leave after that this was 30 years ago i wonder what would have happened if i just kept running i also wonder what would have happened if i or my friend had told an adult about it i mean it was a few streets down from my house he could have been identified or maybe we were ultimately the bad guys So this only happened yesterday, and it's been driving me crazy. It's not as wild as other stories on here, but it's by far one of the creepiest things that's ever happened to me. So my husband and I are walking home from having a beer at the local pub around 6 p.m. In terms of setting the scene, we live in a small New Zealand town. Population around 2,000. That's a real mixed bag in terms of residents. You got older folk, meth heads, low income but increasingly commuters from our capital city have been settling here. We fall into the latter category. It's spring here, so it's still plenty light, and we're just chatting as we walk the 10 minutes or so home. About three minutes into the walk, at the first intersection on our walk, I spot a cat sitting on the fence of one of the corner houses on the other side of the street from us. I say meow, and it meows back. It then starts stalking a bird, so my husband and I continue watching this house. The cat, really, as we walk past. Suddenly, a person with a brown paper bag mask on their head kind of stumbles out of the front door of this house into the yard. Their mannerisms and how they're moving are so strange, but not what I'd associate with being drunk. The house itself seems completely dead, so there's no party on or anything. The person then turns to us and makes eye contact. Well, the eye holes in the mask are staring at us and they slowly start backing away to the front door alcove of the house and disappear from view into the alcove. We've been slowly walking this whole time, and at this point, I have literal goosebumps and an intense sense of dread. When I write it down, it sounds so silly, but there was something so creepy about this person. We're still looking as we walk past the house, and the paper bag face slowly emerges from the alcove, watching us before disappearing from view again. As we walk and get further and further away, we keep turning around to look. And the same happens over and over again. Nothing. And then slowly but surely, the paper bag face emerges out to watch us. This continued until we were at the end of the street, some 350 meters, and rounded the corner out of sight. It still makes my skin crawl thinking about it. My husband laughed and said it was probably just some kid getting ready from Halloween or effing with us. And he's probably right. But I had to keep turning around to watch my back the rest of the walk home. 
because I was so creeped out. This happened when I was about 16 years old, so over 20 years ago. I have five younger siblings, and my little sister would have been five years old. We live in a bad neighborhood, in the housing projects. Our neighbor was nice, but she always had sketchy looking people hanging around, especially men. One day, these two new guys started hanging out there every day. They'd always be outside smoking or just sitting on her porch. They made me really uncomfortable. They were always staring at me and would sometimes try to get me to walk over and talk to them. Or they'd come over into our yards when my parents weren't home and talk to me. Asking me if I had a boyfriend and asking me if I wanted some beer or weed. I was a goody two-shoes Mormon girl, so I always said, no, thank you. I have to go inside now. They were probably both around 30 years old or so. Then they started coming over and asking to use our phone when my parents weren't home. My parents always let the neighbors use our phones, so I never said no, but I would just pass it through the door and make them stay on the porch. They'd sometimes ask to come in or try to talk to me, but I would tell them no because my parents weren't home. Now I realize how dumb that was because they could have just pushed the door open, but I was raised to ignore red flags and be polite and sweet at all times. Anyway, we had a little dog, and I always took him outside early in the morning on a leash. I was out one morning and one of the guys came inside and stood there staring at me for a few minutes and then went back in. I brought the dog inside and just a few minutes later, there's a quiet knock on the door. I opened it and both guys are there and one says, we just saw your baby sister out by the highway. You need to come get her. I panicked and ran outside with them. I started to run down our street towards the highway and one of them says, no, we'll drive you down there. We need to hurry. I seriously took two steps towards their truck before I realized what I was doing. I stopped and said that I needed to go back inside and tell my parents. And the man closest to me grabbed my arm and jerked me towards the truck yelling, We have to go now. She's going to get hit by a car. I instantly felt sick and just yelled, Let go of me. He dropped my arm and I ran back inside my house. I ran into my parents' bedroom to wake them up and my little sister was sleeping in their bed with them. I woke up everyone because I was freaking out and my dad ran outside and the guys in their truck were gone. I never saw them at the neighbor's house again. I wish I could say that my parents called the police or something, but they just kind of shrugged it off and made excuses like maybe they saw another kid that looked like your sister. So this story happened almost two decades ago. I never had a place to tell it until this subreddit. Despite this, this makes up one of my core memories from childhood because of how creepy it was when I was younger. It was around 2008. Me, my mom, my dad, and my brother were on a bus to go to a very popular and well-known mall when I was around the age of four. At the time, we didn't have a car, so we had to take a few buses from where we lived to get to this mall. This one bus that we got on that led to this mall directly from one of the stops was super crowded. I mean, everyone was riding up on each other crowded. There wasn't much room for any of us to move, so my family and I had to stand. Sometime during the bus ride, when we were getting close to the mall, I ended up getting separated from my parents, forced behind roughly two or three people, and unsure of where my parents were. We were near the back, by the rear doors. I was standing just a foot or two away from the stairs which led to an elevated area of the bus, and beside me was this old dude who was sitting in the seat next to me. Something that my parents taught me when I was a kid was that whenever the bus is moving, you were to always hold onto the rails so you don't get knocked around or go flying off. Due to my position on the bus, there was only a singular rail that I could hold onto, the one right in front of this guy's seat. Because of what I was taught, I naturally held onto it so I wouldn't bump into people in front of me. This old guy, in response, grabs onto my hand firmly, holding my hand against the rail so I couldn't let go or get away. This man looked like your average grandpa and appeared to be likely in his 70s, definitely able to overpower me, who was basically just out of toddler range. 
the facial expression this man made is forever engraved into my mind. I cannot ever unsee it. Instead of this gentle smile like an old grandpa would make at a child, his chin was much more sinister, and he laughed at me in response to me trying to get my hand free once the bus had stopped and the doors were open. In fact, when the doors were open, he held onto my hand even tighter to stop me from leaving. Thankfully, I was able to wriggle my hand free because of the position in which his hand was at. I've never had a chance to tell anyone about this story. So Reddit, here you go. Old guy, let's not meet again. Last year, I was staying in a university hall for my final year. It's a private building, so not connected to the university. And out in the city near the main town. We have a car park, but nobody really uses it because we're poor students and it costs money to park there. So mine was one of only two or three cars at any given time. The car park isn't very well lit, and it's to the side of the building, so you have to walk for about two or three minutes to get into the main door. I was sitting in my car one evening after getting back from the gym, just scrolling on my phone because my seat was warm and it was dark and raining outside, so I couldn't be bothered to get up yet. I was reading an article when suddenly someone started knocking on my window, which was really odd. It was a man dressed in all black, and he started telling me how his friend had seen me through the window and thought I was really attractive, so could he have my number? I responded, no, that's a bit odd and I don't feel comfortable with it. He continued to be insistent for a while, practically begging me to get out and give them my number or my social media details, telling me I should come over and speak to his friend, who was weirdly standing at the other side of the car park, furthest away from the building. I kept saying no and scrolling on my phone to show that I wasn't interested. He finally relented and walked away. I texted one of my friends to ask if he'd come and get me and walk me into the building. As I was waiting, the man returned but now with his hood up. And he started banging loudly on my window, saying that I was being rude, ungrateful, and calling me all kinds of names. I kept staring at my phone and pretended I couldn't hear him. He then started trying the door handle. Thankfully, I locked my car after the first encounter, and then began violently pushing into my car when it didn't work. I still kept ignoring him, and text for my friend to probably bring some other friends with him. My friend was taking a long time to read my message, and I was terrified but for some reason didn't think to call the police. Probably because I was afraid of things escalating. The guy at my window had calmed down after a few minutes and walked off, saying that he'd leave me alone now. However, I watched him out of the corner of my eye join up with his friend, and then maybe three or four other men. They walked so that they were out of sight, but I could see their shadows lingering as they kind of circled around my car and moved towards the building but stayed in the dark. They lingered there for a while, until luckily another car came, which was obviously full of students going to a party due to the loud music and singing going on inside. This group of men left as they saw these people arrive, and I latched onto them and was able to walk with them as they entered the building. When I got home, my friend finally responded. He said that he'd actually heard about these guys before. Apparently, they'd followed another girl into the building and into the lift a couple of days prior, then stood in the lift making really gross sexual comments to her. She'd had to run to her door and lock it, where they then stood outside knocking on the door and whispering for her to open it. We were able to report this to the building, who, to their credit, then hired a permanent set of security staff. We also got the CCTV footage of both incidents and were able to pass this on to police. So, weird men harassing young women at my university building? Let's not meet. This happened seven years ago, but I still remember the fear I felt like it was yesterday. When I was in my early 20s, I worked the night shift at a bakery making the donuts. I loved that job. Three nights of the week, I would be with my co-worker, and two nights I would work alone. It was summertime, and we were having some problems with the AC, so the maintenance guy, Andy, came at night when I was on the clock to work on it. The bakery was small and crowded during the day, so it was best for him to come when it was empty. 
Management always let me know when Andy would be there, so it would never be a surprise. At first, he was very pleasant, and I had no issues sharing space with him as he worked. One evening, this changed. My coworker was a little late. She said she'd lost track of time in the shower. So Andy piped in, saying, We should all shower together to save time, and starts laughing. It was creepy as hell. He also had stated I lived alone, with his response being, Good. I have you to myself then. After this night, I realized Andy wasn't the kind of guy that I thought he was. I stopped speaking to him unless I had to. And before long, the AC was repaired and I thought I was free of him. Fast forward to a night a few weeks later. I'm working alone. It's two in the morning. I'm trying donuts when I hear all of a sudden a loud banging on the front window. Startled, I looked up and see who else but Andy. He's calling my name and asking to be let in. No one had said anything to me about him coming that night. Andy then starts pulling on the front door handles. Luckily, it's locked. I run into a corner of the bakery where he can't see me, and I try calling my manager with no response. The phone starts ringing, and I can see the caller ID from where I'm sitting. It's Andy. He's being relentless and won't stop banging on the window and trying to pry the door open. My fear is rising. I dial 911. The cops arrive within 10 minutes and search Andy's vehicle. In the back seat, they find duct tape, a knife, and rope. They can't do anything, though, because he hasn't harmed me. Andy told the police he was there to fix the AC. My manager calls me back in the morning and tells me the AC is working fine, and they never asked Andy to come. So, whatever you had planned for me, Andy, I'm glad that I never found out. Let's never meet again. I don't live in the best area, but it's close to my kid's school and it's what we can afford. I was in line at a stoplight waiting for it to change so I could get to the school to pick up my older kids. I had my toddler with me. While I was waiting, I heard my passenger side handle move like someone was trying to open it. I always lock my car doors out of habit. My car is older, so they don't lock automatically when I start the car like the newer ones do. I look over, and there's an older woman aggressively trying to open my door. My window was cracked a bit for fresh air, but not all the way down. She reached up trying to get the window to go down, but couldn't get her fingers in. Woman. Excuse me. I need you to help me out. I need a ride. Now, I'm all for helping people, but not when they're trying to get in my car with no explanation. You just don't do that. Me. Do you need me to call 911? Woman. No. You need to help me. Let me in. Come on now, help me out. Pulls on door again. Luckily for me, the light changed and I told her, Sorry, but I have to go. I can't help you. I drove off and haven't seen her since. It's the only way to get my kids to school, so I have to drive through that way about every day. So, lady, let's not meet. I don't know how long he was in my bed or why he was there. All I know is that he woke me up with a kiss, which I promptly wiped off with my hand. I was fully clothed, which hinted to me nothing had happened, but the buttons of my pants were undone. I don't know if they were undone the whole time or if he undid them. Under the sheets, I could see that my shirt was pushed up, so he could put his hands on my waist and hold me close to him. I moved his hand off, and he went back to sleep. I sat up in shock and caught a glimpse of his face. I asked him, what are you doing? And he yawned and said, resting. I brought out my hands and tightened them into fists. I was ready to defend myself. And at that moment, he said, okay, I'll leave and walked out of my room. I was so overcome with horror that I pushed my dresser up to the door to make sure he couldn't come back in. I immediately took a shower and was relieved that nothing worse had happened to me, to my knowledge. After all, I'd gone to bed at 11, and when I found him in my bed, it was 5 a.m. I had a weird dream that night, too. In that dream, I lived in a zoo, and the zookeeper deliberately let every animal out of the cage so that they would roam free. One of those animals was a tiger, 
And when it saw me, it immediately started trying to eat me, so I fought back. I was wrestling it. Then I lost. And as the tiger had me pinned down, it started licking me. And that was when I woke up to him kissing me. In my drunken stupor, I was fighting him. Edit. Thank you for trying to help me. But this all happened last September. There's not much I can do about it now. I felt compelled to post because I had a nightmare about that last night. And even though it happened so long ago, I'm still scared he might be out there. I don't want justice at this point. Just someone to listen. This story happened just a few years back when I was visiting an old friend in Cologne while at the same time taking advantage of him as a free stay for a meeting with my LARP group. For those of you who don't know what LARP is, it's basically real life role playing. Imagine a D&D game, but instead of people sitting around a table with dice, you have people actually dressed up as their characters, actually role playing in real life. LARPing was my hobby since I was 14. And after I got a job that paid pretty well, I started to go a bit more all out when it came to stuff for my hobby. One of the things that I spent a solid amount of money on was my character's armor. Important for this story. It's the chain mail that I wear under my outer armor. After the meeting of my group, I mostly got out of my LARP outfit because I really didn't want to walk through Cologne Mulem, which is one of the more dangerous places in this city as a medieval knight, but since I couldn't fit it all in my back, I kept my chainmail on, as well as my tunic and pants. On my bus ride home, I noticed some guys seemed to have an eye on me, but I guessed it was because I still looked very much out of place. When he got off at the same station as me, I didn't really pay him much attention. I was almost at my friend's place and decided to call him, asking if we should meet and get a donor which he agreed to before I even ended my question. I arrived at our meeting spot first and waited. Then I noticed the guy from the bus station again, who now walked straight towards me. I got closer to the wall to make space, but he didn't pass me. He stopped before me and pulled a knife on me, demanding my bag, wallet, and phone. I was willing to give him my wallet, but tried to explain that the bag only had some armor and foam weapons but it seems that even just talking was enough to set this guy off, and suddenly I felt two fast stinging punches in my stomach. It hurt like hell and I dropped down and the guy grabbed my bag. Honestly, the next things are not really in my mind. I was barely able to notice anything other than the voice in my head screaming you got stabbed. So the next thing I noticed was my friend shaking me. My bag was open and my stuff all over the place, and he was holding my helmet with blood on it. He told me he saw the guy throwing my stuff around after the bag was most likely too heavy and big for him. So my friend, seeing me on the floor, managed to grab the first thing he could, which was the helmet, and bash the guy with it until he ran away. We later checked my stomach, and even though I had two giant deep blue bruises which hurt like hell, I only had small cuts since the chainmail stopped the knife. Until this day, I get sick in my stomach when I think back on that day. And remember that if I had not worn a piece of my LARP clothing that day, I would be dead. Literally killed over a bag of costumes, 150 euros in my wallet, and a 10-year-old phone. This world is beyond messed up. When I was 16, some friends and I went to an outdoor concert festival thing. We parked at the mall and took a shuttle to the venue. For perspective, the mall is a 20 minute drive from our homes, and the venue is another 20 minutes away in a different direction. During the concert, I end up losing my friends in the crowd. I don't care much as I wanted to get to the front, and I could just call them after the event ended. Well, of course I lost my phone somewhere in the sea of people and I don't even notice until the last show wraps up. I search the ground as the people dissipate with no luck. 
Reluctantly, I just hop on the bus heading back to the mall, hoping to meet them at the car. The car is gone and I start to freak out a little. It's 10 p.m. when I head to the bus station to see when the next bus to my city is coming. Just my luck. It happens to be Memorial Day, so no buses until 10 a.m. I borrow a stranger's phone and call the two numbers that I know, my mom and my brother. My mom doesn't answer. My brother does. He basically gives me the sucks-to-suck talk and hangs up. So I'm alone, scared, and a little drunk in a city that I don't know. I try walking, but quickly give up when I realize I'm basically walking down a random highway towards who knows where. Back at the station, I'm just staring at the map when a stranger creeps up behind me. He asks where I'm heading, and I tell him the truth. He, conveniently, is going to the same city, and asks if I'd like to split a cab. Realizing this is my only option, as I didn't have enough on my own, we get in the car. Turns out, he has even less than I do. We barely have enough to get to the heart of the city, which is a ten minute drive from my house. But at least I know my way home from there. During the drive, this guy gets progressively more creepy. He's aware I'm 16. He's 25. He scoots closer every minute, touching me, insisting I come back with him to his place, and even writes his phone number down on my bare leg. As we get there, I realize the situation that I'm in. We're about to get out in a quiet area at 2 a.m., and the cabbie is going to drive off, leaving no one to hear me scream. The second he gets out, I turn to the driver and beg him to take me a few streets further so I could at least put some distance from him and me. The cab driver hadn't said a word the whole way, but he definitely heard everything. He asks me for my address and drives me all the way home. Creeper watches as the cab drives off, me still inside. When we got to my home, I offered to wake up my mom to pay him, but he declined, saying he's just glad I'm safe. I broke in through the kitchen window, got to bed, and cried my tears of relief for who knows how long. So, to the cab driver who tried to get with a teenage girl, let's not meet. And to the cab driver who saved my skin, thank you. I once met up with an old friend of mine a friend I had known for a few years prior to the meetup in November of 2017. I had actually met this person on a dating site. However, as time went on, the relationship between us became strictly platonic. There were no red flags. My gut did not warn me, so I completely trusted this person. We met up in town, behind a bus station, on a grassy hill surrounded by trees and a tall wall. Our meeting was just to have a smoke get a little high, and to have a small catch-up. The meetup was fine. I had actually started smoking weed a few months before, so I was still relatively new to it. He had brought something for me to try. Purple Haze. I wasn't at all anxious about trying it, as I completely trusted this person, and would never believe that he would lie to me. He had packed a full blunt for me, but I only managed to smoke a quarter of the blunt. We spoke during this time about work, our previous relationships, and other random stuff. About half an hour later, I started to feel extremely lightheaded and anxious. I suddenly had this strange feeling where I did not feel comfortable at all, and I really wanted to go home. When I asked him if I could go home, he offered to take me, but I said, no, it's okay. He offered again, please, let me take you home. You'll be safe with me. I wouldn't hurt you. I shook my head and said, No thank you. I can take myself home. When I started to walk away, I felt like I was walking on a cloud. My head became dizzy and my eyesight was a little blurry. I had never felt like this before, and in time, I started to panic. When we made our way down the hill towards the bus station, I was relieved, as there were a lot of people around, so if anything happened, someone would step in. I became extremely terrified of him. I had this horrible feeling in my gut that told me to get away from him. When I got to the bus station, I told him I would call my taxi here and go home. His tone was no longer nice, but very stern. I'm going to take you home now. 
and he began to pull at my jacket. I told him no, and that I was going home on my own. He pulled my jacket harder and I fell against him. He pulled me into him and told me I didn't need to be scared of him. But I was so terrified at this point. I started to feel very paranoid and I couldn't see properly. I pushed him away from me and rubbed my eyes and called for a taxi. He tried to pull my phone from me and yelled in my face. Do you ever listen? I'm taking you home. I noticed a few people had stopped and asked if I was okay. All I remember was that I wanted to go home. So a lady kindly called a taxi for me and waited with me, made sure I was okay and helped me into the taxi. During the time I was waiting for the taxi, he kept trying to get me to come to his car with him. But that lady looked after me. She told him to go home and that she was going to take me home instead. So he left. When I got home, I gave the taxi driver money and told him to keep the change. I didn't want to wait around. I just wanted to go into my bed because at that time, it was the only place I would feel safe from harm. That evening, I laid in my bed for five hours straight, just staring at the ceiling. I don't remember if I thought about anything or if my mom came in at any time. I just remember lying in bed, doing nothing, until the paranoia and the sickly feeling began to wear off. I remember looking at my phone and seeing that I had 32 missed calls from him, 10 voicemails left, and over 50 messages. The messages were weird. He had sent around 20 messages just asking where I was and when I got home. And in one of the voicemails, he had told me how he had this fantasy of taking me home whilst drug up and tying me up. He wanted to blindfold me, and he wanted me to submit myself to him. I freaked out and blocked him on all social media, Instagram, Snapchat, Discord, and I blocked his phone number. Before the blocking, I told him that if he ever contacted me again, I would call the police. I heard nothing from him for a month, until I received a text from an unknown number asking me how I was. I hadn't given my number to anyone, so I ignored it. I then received another message a few days later, saying they missed me and that they would see me soon. I asked who they were. No reply. Nothing. So, creepy person who pretended to be my friend, I don't want to see you ever again. This was an event that happened in my childhood, and to this day, I've never gotten over it. This was around the time of my ninth birthday, and looking back on this night, I was sure that I would not have made it to my tenth had it gone any different. At the time, my family, one of my friends from school, Tasha, and I were visiting our family friend's cabin for a party about 15 minutes from our town. This party was large as all the surrounding cabins were filled with other acquaintances and close friends. Everyone knew each other, and everyone had kids of their own, so there were plenty of people to play with for my younger brother, friend, and I. The cabins were off of a small gravel road that connected to a larger, main paved one that was fairly secluded. In the middle of the cabins was a cleared section of forest, with a bonfire pit that was the communal party grounds. Otherwise, all the cabins were separated by short trails through dense forests, just large enough for pickup trucks to squeeze through. Since all the cabins were connected by this gravel road and had trails going in between, it made great territory for hide-and-seek tag, or a manhunt as the older, cooler kids called it, when we visited. This was super common pastime, while the adults chatted and since all the children, including my brother and I, were well acquainted with a broad age range between 7 and 13, it was one of my only things we could do together, while still having fun. We had played hundreds of times over the many visits we shared, and it was not an uncommon to hide in backyards, ditches, just into the forest, and under decks. We always drew clear boundaries set by the older kids to contain the many kids to a fair playing area, and stayed out playing well past sunset most nights until it eventually got too dark to see. None of the adults minded us running around like this, since everyone knew everyone, and the small cluster of cabins were close together, 
and the patches of dense forest between them were no more than a hundred meters deep before you hit someone's yard. Of course, it also meant that all the children would be occupied so the parents and adults could drink and talk without inhibition. This night, however, we wanted to expand the playing field. Along with my friend Tasha, many of the other kids had friends with them, and other invitees from outside the area had brought kids along as well. It was decided that our normal playing zone was too small for our numbers to be fair, and so the request was made to extend to the next cabin cluster over. The adults were hesitant, as the next cluster was only accessible by going all the way up the gravel road to the bigger paved one, and then walking a good distance down it until the next gravel road shot off from it. However, with the promise to pair up and the urging of all the kids, this was permitted, with the caveat that we return to our normal playing grounds before sunset. This was occurring at the time of year where fall had set in and it was very cold in the evenings. However, the trees still had all their dead leaves, so the forest was only marginally sparser. Tasha and I were playing together as a pair in the usual cluster, but realized that the only people around were other hiders and figured it would be more fun to try and stalk to taggers who were definitely in the next cluster. We held hands along the paved road just in case one of us fell into the steep ditches on either side, but also for warmth, as well as since it was freezing. Once we got to the other cluster, Tasha and I immediately split up like spies. Tasha would scout about 50 feet in front of me and motion me forward when the coast was clear, while I watched for taggers from our behind. This continued with a few narrow escapes and a lot of running and careful scoping. These were roads and paths none of us had played on, and the new territory was thrilling. But we were sensible enough not to run in the other people's yards or under their decks. This left us exposed on the road to taggers, but it was safer in this unfamiliar landscape. What happened next was so shocking that at the time I remember thinking I was making it up until my story was corroborated by Tasha and the other kids. As Tasha and I were making our way, like I described, down the main gravel road, We thought we heard footsteps crunching along and decided to duck between two different cars parked on the road. Tasha was fairly far in front of me and I lost sight of her as I crouched down behind my own car. I remember staying there for a few minutes to make sure the coast was clear, but waited for a signal from Tasha to say that we were okay up ahead. Eventually, I got antsy and stood up to tell her to stop hiding. I have no idea how my instincts completely failed me, but to my horror, A large, ice-cold, rough hand sprung out to snatch my wrist. I jumped in shock and spun around to see that behind me was a tall man in a red hoodie and black beanie. He was looming over me with one hand in his jean pocket and the other holding my wrist in a death grip. I was so surprised that I couldn't even scream. It was like my throat was suddenly filled with cement and my voice had become a heavy rock that sunk down into my stomach. I was frozen, just staring up at this stranger with no expression. It felt like we stared at each other for hours, both of us completely still. Even at nine, I could clearly see the turmoil rolling over this guy's face. It disturbed me to feel how he would tighten and loosen his hold on my wrist like he was contemplating something. My mind was steamrolled with panic while this continued for what I assume now was only seconds. What did this guy want? Was it his car and he was mad? Was he going to tell my parents that I messed with it? Was I in trouble? Where was Tasha? Did he own a cabin here? Maybe he wanted us to play somewhere else. Finally, the silence and stillness stopped and the man grunted. It pulled me right out of my thoughts and I saw him moving his hand inside his pocket like he was fishing for something. He was fidgeting around in there and it was super distracting. I was staring at his hand wondering what was going on when I saw under the edge of his hoodie the unmistakable shape of a five inch buck knife tucked into his waistband on his opposite hip. At the same time, I saw it, his grip firmed and he started pulling me off the road and towards the forest. Finally, my survival instincts kicked in and I immediately started to struggle, pulling against him in a losing battle due to the gravel under my shoes. It seemed to surprise him, and he temporarily relaxed his hand just enough that I could yank my arm away. He stood there and watched as I ran off, down the road and towards the nearest older kid that I could see. I looked back just once, 
and in his hand was the buck knife. I was already too far to chase. When I did find another older kid, I had them walk back with me to find Tasha, still shocked from what happened. I told them I had lost her, but when we got back to the cars, Tasha immediately ran up to me and started to freak out. The older kid wanted to know what was going on, and when pressed, I explained what had occurred. The older kid swiftly walked us back to a larger group of kids and made us all walk back to the other cluster and said that the game was over. Then, they and three other kids went around and yelled that the game was over and wrangled up the other kids. Once we were all accounted for, the older kids ran over to the adults and told them what happened. From there, everything devolved into chaos as angry parents with flashlights hopped on quads and drove off to search while other adults checked on all of us. When all was said and done, we found out that Tasha had seen the whole thing and was just about to signal to me when she had peeked out from behind her car and saw the man standing behind me. She said he was actually there for a while before I got up and described the same behavior as I did. Still, quiet, hand moving around his pocket, just looming. She had stayed hidden behind the car and said he wandered into the forest after I had left. It is only now that I am older, I understand he was playing with himself through his pocket and considered taking me to the woods to have his way and possibly kill me, considering the knife. We found out later that night, a few other kids had seen him walking down the paved road and setting just at the edge of the forest on a few different occasions, but didn't think much of it. Our parents never found wherever he went, mostly due to the large gap in time between when he disappeared and when we told our parents. To this day, it remains a super repressed memory that becomes an intrusive thought once in a while. Like I mentioned, even at the time, I thought that I had imagined the experience. It was too real, and though I have had times in my life where I felt worse in the moment, I get sick thinking about what would have happened. It makes me feel even worse to think about how I left Tasha and what would have happened if she had been discovered or had come to my aid. This world is full of sick weirdos. I am a 23 year old female and a few weeks ago me and a friend who is also a 24 year old female planned to go to an event together. Since we only had free time after work, we decided to get an Uber so we wouldn't take too long to arrive and could enjoy more. The first half of the ride was really normal, seemed like a normal, polite dude. But as soon as we got to the highway, his attitude changed. He seemed a lot more irritated. Me and my friend didn't pay much attention though and kept chatting between ourselves. Our attention was drawn when he started shouting with another driver. He turned to us and said he was going to pull over. I tried objecting, but he ignored and pulled over anyway. He reached out for the glove compartment and pulled out a gun. Important to note that guns are illegal in my country. We were just watching this unfold with holded breaths. And when the other guy drove away, we let out a sigh of relief. But then we were still stuck in a car with a crazy man with a gun. After that, he went back to driving and apologized to us, saying that the guy was tailgating him. I let out and all okay. We kept talking. That guy is lucky that you two girls are here, or else I would have followed him and shot him in the face. Sleazy idiot. I look over to my friend. She's in shock and paralyzed. I'm in shock too, but trying to keep my cool because the last thing I want is to get him annoyed at us. If he was willing to shoot that guy for tailgating, I didn't want to know what he would do to us if I had said the wrong thing. No, it's okay. I understand. I was trying to appease him. These guys need to be taught a lesson, he continued while I just agreed with my head. I did that before, you know. You just trap the guy in an empty street. And when he leaves the car, bang. Did he just admit to murder? Was the only thing running through my mind. But I managed to keep calm and just agreed with him the rest of the way. He did deliver us right to the place with no more incidents. I waited a few weeks to report, since he had my home address and... Wouldn't be hard to figure out who reported him. Nobody showed up in my home with a gun. At least until now. And Uber has answered my report, 
saying that they started an investigation. I really hope that this guy doesn't do this to anyone else. My grandfather, Jim, died when I was 17, around five years ago, and his last months were rough on the whole family. He had advanced brain cancer, but he spent most of his time at home under hospice care. One afternoon, it was about two weeks before he died, I was alone with my grandpa, waiting for the hospice nurse to come check in on him. A man who I'd never seen before, Dave, knocked on the door. He was wearing hospital scrubs but he hadn't brought any equipment with him, which was odd. I asked him if he worked with the hospital, and he nodded. He said this was his first shift with Jim, but that he'd reviewed my grandfather's file, and that he wanted to speak to whichever family member had the legal authority to pull the plug. Jim wasn't even on life support, so I guess Dave was using plug as an expression. On my grandfather. I should say that I live in a right-to-die state, where euthanasia is legal, so it's not like that option had never occurred to us. But as far as I know, no member of my family had ever expressed an openness to euthanizing Jim. I told him that I had no authority to make that decision, and that my grandfather, who was now delirious and unable to consent to much of anything, had specifically said to prolong his life indefinitely unless he was crying out in extreme pain, which he wasn't. Dave put his hand on my shoulder as though he were consoling me, and he talked about how old people become burdens that their families need to let go of. Then, Dave pulled a bottle of pills out of his pocket and said that they were barbiturates that would trigger a peaceful death. He said the coroner would determine that Jim died naturally from his cancer. I started to panic, and I firmly told him that under no circumstance would we be euthanizing my grandfather at this time. But he started to untwist the bottle as he walked towards Jim's bed. I tried to wrestle the pills from his hand, and he seemed startled. He played innocent and said he just wanted to show the pills to Jim. Dave knew perfectly well that my grandfather had almost no idea what was going on. I called 911 and rapidly explained the situation to the dispatcher. Dave suddenly became very scared and bolted out of the house. The cops arrived within five minutes, and Jim's actual hospice nurse arrived a few minutes after that. Based on my physical description, the police slash hospital staff were able to identify Dave as a recently fired hospital orderly. My entire primary school experience felt like a fever dream, but I don't think I could fit all into a post. So instead, I'm choosing to tell the most bizarre experience in my schooling life. In my school, the language sub that I was taking had teachers leaving almost every three months, some due to finding a job with higher wages. This teacher, however, left due to his disturbing attitudes towards the kids, ages eight to 10 years old. This teacher is Mr. John. He came to our school during the second semester of grade five, my class. He was not only a language teacher, but a PE and arts teacher as well, despite not having any experience in either fields. At first, he made a good impression, cracking jokes and giving helpful advice. However, one day he started deterring to very mature topics while he was teaching. He would talk about paintings, but somehow divert the conversation to body odor and what kind of object would emit such terrible smells such as excrements. He would go too much into detail about excrements nothing you learn from biology to the point where it's not funny but disturbing he later talked about puberty which at first seemed normal but later talked about how puberty changes you such as your body parts and other feelings you get we were eight he then showed pictures of his ex-girlfriend when she was 17 she was getting married he had her photos in a file on his computer the final blow was him taking off his shirt and showing every scar and injury that was inflicted on him. He forced us to look at all of them. We were so uncomfortable. Finally, I complained to the principal along with a few others. He tried to find those who complained about him, 
He asked around and interrogated two of my friends. This teacher was unhinged. To Mr. John, let's not meet. I recently came across this sub, and oh boy do I have a story that fits. For context, this happened 20 years ago just after Christmas. I had turned six a month prior. My mom went out one day and left my then 16-year-old cousin to look after me and my two older siblings, brother eight, sister 11. My cousin decided to take us out into the city, which was 10 minutes from where we live. We took the bus walked around the city in incredibly unsafe neighborhoods with basically another child responsible for us, and after a few hours got tired and decided to go home. The city had a central area for buses. Not a bus station, but like a huge perfectly square field with some plants and flowers and bushes. Lining all four sides along the street were a couple bus stops and benches, so basically you could catch several buses from that area going all over the county slash city. Since it was just after Christmas, the bushes along the field were still covered in Christmas lights. As we waited for the bus, I began to wander away as I admired the lights. My cousin, none the wiser. At some point, I heard a man say hi. I looked up from the bush and he was smiling down at me. Thinking back on it, once I got older, it was clear he was homeless and was probably on drugs. He had longish brown hair that was wet teeth that were black along the gums and his clothes were incredibly dirty and torn and he had several jackets on none of this really registered in my six-year-old brain so i just smiled back up and said hi he asked if i like looking at the lights and i said yes they're pretty he said i'll never forget this exact sentence you like christmas lights got some really cool lights at my house you'll love want to come see them i eagerly said yes so he reached down his hand to me and I took it. We started to walk away and were headed to the corner of the field where a few big buildings were. He said his apartment was just a couple blocks away. So we were headed around the corner of the building when my arm jerked backwards and I turned to see my sister pulling me away from him. He didn't say a single word, just took off instantly running. It took a few years for me to fully grasp the danger that I was in. My sister and brother talked about what happened a lot and how scary it was. When I finally got a little older, I appreciated how terrifying this all was, and how close I was to having my life change, or end forever. If I had rounded that city corner with them, they never would have been able to find me in time, because they wouldn't even know where to start looking before we disappeared around the corner into the city. It's something we still bring up sometimes to this day. To that homeless man, let's not meet again. I found this thread, so I thought that I would share my experience. This happened when the Night Stalker show was really big on Netflix, so it was fresh in our mind because we were watching it. Earlier in the day, I was in my room with my dogs and roommate when we thought we heard the door open. We didn't think much of it until my roommate left the room a few minutes later and started screaming, and I heard the dog that followed her going nuts. The front door was wide open, and somebody saw her and fled. They had been in our house and presumably heard us in the room chatting while doing who knows what. The dog ran the person off. We were really startled, but we figured that it was over and started locking the door, and that was that. Later that night, as we were watching the last episode of the Night Stalker show, we heard the doorknob jiggle. It's like 2 a.m., so we paused and looked at the door, kind of shook and confused. When it registered what was happening, my roommate started to yell for them to go away and that the police were coming. My dumb self isn't too fond of calling the police, so I hesitated. But then they started banging something against the door, trying to break it down. I grabbed my roommate, the dogs, and my partner, and we all rushed into another room to put more doors between us while police were on the way. I also had to stop my partner from trying to go out with a sword because we didn't know what this person might have or be trying to do. Luckily, he couldn't break the door down before police arrived and he fled. They caught him and he fought. 
So he's in jail for a lot longer than he would have been. He admitted to police that he heard women when he came into the wrong house earlier. But no man, so he came back to, quote unquote, find a friend. They never found the weapon he used on our door. And he won't say what it was, but it messed up the metal pretty badly. This happened Sunday night. I got into a huge fight with my mom, and it was very emotional and intense to say the least. We made up, said goodnight to each other, blah, blah, blah. But I was still angry. So my impulsive self decided I was going to take off for the night. I just wanted to cool off. I went into my backyard and hopped over one of our walls and started walking around. Mind you, it was midnight and I'm a teenage girl that is on the skinny side walking around in a not so well lit area. I didn't even have a phone in case something happened or a weapon for self-protection. For a bit of a layout of my story, down the street from my house, which is a neighborhood road, there's a church and a preschool across from it. In front of the preschool, there are large tall hedges that sort of hide the pickup slash drop-off that's in the front of the school. There's a stop sign on the church's corner before the busy main road and a street lamp on the same corner. I made my way from the corner on the church's side. I was very bored and cold, but it's not like I could call a friend to pick me up and hang out for the night. I decided to face the main road and put a hitchhiker's thumb up in hopes of someone pulling into the street and letting me use their phone to call a friend. After what felt like forever, I was getting no luck, and then I saw a guy cross the main road and I called for him. I didn't have any weird feelings about him. He was harmless and he let me use his phone, but I still wasn't able to find any of my friends to come get me. Before he left, he asked if I had a knife on me or something. I said, honestly, I forgot mine at home. He handed me a small but very sharp switchblade and told me to keep it, to stay safe and to have a good night. After watching him walk into the dark heading east, I wandered up and down the sidewalk as cars pass by often. I started to pass the hedges and I glanced over to the left of me where the school was. I saw a large silhouette of a man slowly creeping around in front of the doors to the small preschool. He was tall and looked like he was strong. Broad shoulders, too. It took me a second to realize he stopped and saw me, too. I went into flight mode and immediately noped the hell out of there and ran across the busy street because it was empty at the moment and I kept sprinting until I was five streets down and realized he wasn't following me. About 30 minutes had gone by and I decided it was time I made my way home. I eventually crossed the street and was facing the main road walking down to the church and I take a left to get home. It was silent and no cars had gone by for a few minutes at that point. Then I heard a car speeding down the road and I turned my head back to see it was a large white suburban. I dismissed it thinking nothing of it as I turned right a few streets down across the road. I started to run the corner under the street lamp when I looked back up again and saw it was starting to come out of the same road it had just turned into. I'm not sure why or how my gut was telling me to run, but I did. I ran into the parking lot of the church and started to see headlights turn into the street. I threw myself onto the ground behind a ramp wall that was barely tall enough to hide me. Next thing I know, I'm about to cry because of how freaked out I was while trying to stay silent at the same time because the Suburban's headlight reflected off the walls of the building as it passed into the parking lot. It made a few laps from what I could sneak a peek of, and stopped in the middle for a couple of minutes before it turned out and drove into the main road. I waited it out a bit longer and pulled the knife out listening for anything and everything. Once I realized I was probably in the clear, I ran back home. Not sure exactly what was going on, but to whoever was in that white Suburban, let's not meet. This happened when I was young, approximately 8 to 10 years old. I remember it perfectly, but have confirmed the details with my mother, and the memory of it sends chills down both of our spines to this day. It was broad daylight on a Saturday, and I was in the town center with my mother. The streets were busy and people bustled past. 
We paused at a shop front that sold ornaments. The ugly, old-fashioned kind that old grannies like. We'd often stop to look at them and laugh at how expensive they were, wondering how that place even stayed open. I was a real chatterbox as a kid and talking animatedly to my mother about something or another, facing her as I did so. Like it was yesterday, I remember her smiling face and how it suddenly dropped. Her jaw hung open and her eyes were as big as dinner plates. She just stared at me silently for a few seconds and then grabbed my arm hard and pulled me away. Her fingers were digging into my arm as she dragged me into the crowd, walking as fast as she could without running. Being that kid, I squealed and loudly kept saying, What are you doing? Ouch. Mom, you're hurting me. That hurts. Where are we going? While trying to stop. She gritted her teeth and silently dragged me for about three streets before stopping somewhere less busy for a second. It was only then that she let go of my arm, rubbing it and looking extremely upset. Looking me dead in the eye, she explained that I was talking outside of the shop. She noticed an old man stood behind me. He was dirty and disheveled, like the horror movie stereotype of a creepy old man. I had pretty long hair as a little girl and people stopped us all the time to remark on it, especially when I wore it loose. This old man had very gently lifted a handful of my hair in his hand and was smelling it, tickling his nose as he did so. I was clearly so absorbed in telling my story I hadn't even realized I was being touched. My mother made eye contact with the man as he opened his eyes while inhaling the smell of my hair. He gave her an absolutely nauseating toothy grin, quickly dropping my hair and waving at her, waggling his fingers all cutesy-like. Whoopsie, you caught me, was the vibe, clearly knowing exactly what he did. He then disappeared into the throng of people moving past. My poor mother felt sick and just went into autopilot, dragging me away as fast as she could in the opposite direction. I didn't even know how to react when she told me what happened, except to be horrified and so glad that we had gotten away safely. I still walk past that shop, and the memory of my mother's haunted expression makes me feel ill. Creepy old man, let's not meet. Ever. This happened about 15 years ago. I was 21 years old and living in my very first apartment. It was a small bachelor apartment in a sketchy area. I grew up in a town that was known to be rough and tough. I knew how to handle myself and learned at a young age to keep my head down and not to go looking for trouble. My apartment building was behind a bar. A lot of the customers of the bar would stand outside to smoke. When they stood outside to smoke, they would be looking at my apartment. Most of the people who were out smoking would keep to themselves. A few would nod and say hello if I passed by. Never any issues until one evening. One evening, I came home from work. I passed the bar and saw this extremely tall man outside smoking. As I passed by, he stared at me. I gave him a slight nod, but he didn't acknowledge me. He just continued to stare. It made me uncomfortable, but I didn't think much of it. About an hour later, I hear a knock on my door. It was odd, because you have to buzz people into the building. The building only had eight units, and I didn't really know any of the neighbors. I froze because I really didn't want to talk to anyone. But the knocking continued. I finally shouted, Who is it? But there was no response. I shouted again, Who's there? And the voice said, It's Tom. I didn't know anyone named Tom, so I shouted back, I don't know anyone named Tom. You must have the wrong apartment, the voice said. You may not know me, but I know you. Open up so we can talk. I went over to the peephole and it was the tall dude from the bar. I loudly said, F off or I'm calling the cops. I heard his footsteps walk away and heard the building door open and then close. He was gone, or so I thought. A few minutes later, I peeked out the window and he was standing in the parking lot. He seemed to be talking to himself. At this point, I'm freaking out. I called my landlord who lived in the building next to me. He told me to call the police and that in the meantime, him and his brother would come check things out. I call the police and tell them what's going on. They said a car is on the way. 
Meanwhile, my landlord and his brother make their way to the parking lot. I watch out my window and see them approach, the tall dude. Tall dude takes one look at them and bolts. My landlord and his brother try to chase him, but tall dude got away. About five minutes later, the police arrive. I give my version of the events and also a description of the man. The officer stares at me and says, We've had reports of a man matching that description who has been SAing women. Thank God you didn't open that door. A few days later, I get a call from the officer. He told me part of their investigation was talking to the owner of the bar. The owner called the police when Tall Dude reappeared after a few days, and the police responded and arrested him. So, Tall Creepy Dude from the bar, it was a close call, and I sincerely hope I never see you again. Hello everyone. I wanted to share my scary encounter that occurred just yesterday on the bus. So for a bit of context, I'm a college student. Without giving too many details, I'm a woman on the smaller side of average female height. I currently do not have a car, so I use my bike, walking, and the bus to get around. My college has a transit service that allows you to scan in with a student boarding pass for free. Other non-students are allowed to ride the bus by paying upon entering or purchasing a ticket beforehand. I frequently ride the bus for various reasons, grocery runs or treating myself to food. And yesterday I had the idea of treating myself to a movie after all the exams I've been having lately. I'm an avid horror fan and I knew that Terrifier 2 was in theaters. So of course I wanted to see it immediately. One of my friends told me they found it funny and really enjoyed it, which was more than enough reason to go see it. Side note, it was good and hilarious, but of course not your thing, I do not recommend it. I was looking at tickets the day before yesterday and trying to decide which time slot I wanted to see the movie in. Looking back now, something in my gut told me to choose the earlier time. I wish I had listened. Another detail I wanted to add is that there are two bus sizes, a large one and a small one. The bus I rode during the incident was the smaller one. The stop where I got on the bus is the beginning of the route. Unlike every other stop, the driver usually parks the bus here for five minutes and gets off to use the restroom or have a quick break before continuing with the rest of the route. Upon entering the bus, I notice only two other passengers, another girl about my age and an older man. The girl was in the front of the bus on the right side, and the man was in the second row on the left side. I sat on the right side several rows back. I usually read something on my phone or listen to music on the bus, so I immediately got on my phone when I sat down. Everything was okay for a little bit until I looked up and noticed the man repeatedly staring at me and looking away before staring at me again. I was immediately apprehensive, but just brushed it off. He started speaking aloud out of nowhere, saying things like, Beautiful baby, while staring at me. I was frozen out of fear and could only keep looking at my phone and trying to ignore it. This continued until I worked up the courage to say, Sir, would you please stop staring at me? to which he claimed he was not staring and just told me that I was extremely beautiful. Unsure of what to say, I just stupidly thanked him and went back on my phone. He had his body slightly turned, but when I confronted him, he faced fully forward. The driver got back on and we started moving again, so everything was calm for a bit, though I admittedly was still shaken up. This calm did not last long. Obviously, this creep couldn't contain himself, and just had to voice his opinions about me out loud. He started saying similar things again, but also added some new phrases such as, gonna make you my wife, and by far the worst one, I'm gonna get you pregnant. I was shaking at this point and was unsure what to do. I desperately wanted to sit next to the other girl, but did not want to pass by him to sit by her. We made it to two other stops before the girl got off and said sorry before leaving. My heart dropped to my stomach. The last thing I wanted was to be alone with this guy. Luckily, more people got on at this stop. A middle-aged couple and a guy about my age. In a panicked voice, I sort of shouted and asked the guy my age if he would sit with me. He was a bit confused but came to sit by me, and I immediately felt relief. The stress of the situation got to me and I broke down crying. I guess the creep took this as an indication to leave because he swiftly made his exit after that. 
the kind younger guy who sat next to me and began comfort me. I'm so grateful he chose to ride the bus that day. The bus driver noticed the commotion and called me to the front to get information in order to make a report. He told me he couldn't hear anything, but the buses have video and would probably pick up what the creep was saying. He told me the same man had recently been kicked off for a similar incident and that he would be reporting this immediately. For the rest of the ride, the younger guy and I talked about things like majors and other school-related stuff. I wanted to go into marine biology, and he is a graduate student in mechanical engineering. I made it to the movie. It was awesome, and back home safely. But I definitely learned a lesson. My boyfriend is going to help me look into some self-defense items, and he taught me a few fighting tactics. I'm still shaken just writing this, but actually really afraid to leave my room now. Sometimes it's easy to forget that creepy encounters with weirdos can happen at any time. They aren't just stories on the internet. This happened about 10 years ago. I was in graduate school at the time working on my master's degree for clinical social work. My practicum was at a confidential shelter which housed women and children seeking shelter from DV. As I was an intern, I worked a lot of late night shifts. After closing up the shelter, I headed home. It was after midnight and the roads were fairly empty. I lived in a smaller town at the time, so this was not unusual. As I approached the stoplight, I noticed a man a few yards away, walking towards the crosswalk. I suddenly felt very anxious and had an unsettling feeling, so I immediately locked my car doors. This was before I had a car with automatic locks. I usually drove without locking my car doors as I never felt unsafe while doing so. I felt better after having locked my doors and pulled up to the red light. Staring ahead, I noticed the man never crossed the street. I glanced to my right where I had seen him earlier, and came face to face with his face pressed up against my passenger side window. I screamed, honked my horn and told him to go away, but he continued standing there, staring right at me. Then he tried the handle of the door without success. I continued screaming at him, honking my horn and waiting for the red light to change. The man straightened, stepped away from the passenger side door and moved quickly to my driver's side door, trying the handle again but without success. He stood with a wide stance next to my car, as though he was lunging. At the moment I thought to myself, screw it, and slammed the gas to run the red light. The man kind of stumbled when I did this and I think I ran over his foot in my escape. When I arrived home, I woke up my husband to tell him and call the police. The police never found the man as by the time they sent someone he was gone. The police officer did commend me for running the red light, as well as for potentially running over the man's foot. So, to the creepy man who tried to get in my car in the middle of the night, let's not meet. It finally started raining here, so I took my son... 14 year old male out mushroom hunting over the weekend it was later than we normally go and the sun goes down much earlier but we were taking a quick trail to the river and back in hopes of finding turkey tails or chanterelles we took a wrong turn and ended up going through a big field which the trail would take us back around to the main trail to the river as we walked towards the main trail the last group of people had left and it was just me and my son we walked along and out of the thicket side trail came this weird man he had a dog with him that was alert at his side. He was staring at us as we walked closer to him. Then he started waving at us. This really weird slow wave. I was immediately uncomfortable and goosebumpy, but didn't want to be impolite. So I half-heartedly waved back while staring back and telling my son to slow up a little. I didn't want to actually meet up at the junction. After a full minute of us dawdling, the guy slowly turned and began walking down the trail towards the main trail. I was warily walking, didn't want to go too fast, and we stopped to look at some plants. So the guy and dog got further down this trail which curved to the right and continued on two blocks to the junction. I was thinking, if this was a creepy let's not meet, this dude will be waiting around the corner. 
And sure enough, he was standing at the junction, off to the left and towards the parking lot. And to the right was a point six trail to the river. Dude was just standing there with his dog staring at us, not moving at all. Both my son and I were like, holy cow, what's going on? Let's keep wide to the right and saying he looks old. We could probably outrun him and just generally planning for freaky deaky stuff just in case. He kept staring at us, so we approached. I asked if he was okay and kept staring back. He was greasy haired, tiny round glasses, a blue windbreaker, plaid long shorts about 50 years old. His dog was a small beagle mix. He didn't answer me at all, just kept staring. We turned to the right and walked about a block. I had my phone cam facing me so I could watch him over my shoulder, and the only movement was him slowly shifting his direction to continue staring at us. I didn't say anything else to him. It was moderately unsettling, his stare, made more so by the lack of response, emotionless face, weird tiny glasses, slow wave at us, like a zombie. He did leave because on our way back he was no longer standing on the main trail. So, hey, freaky deaky forest zombie dude, for sure stay in the thickets and let's not meet. I am a 22-year-old female, and last night, my husband, who is a 25-year-old male, woke me up at around 11.50 to tell me that someone has been knocking on our door and ringing our apartment doorbell for about 10 minutes on and off. He woke me so I could possibly ID the person. Once I looked out our upstairs apartment window, I saw the man walking to his car in our apartment parking lot across the street from our unit. He was wearing blue jeans and a gray t-shirt. He was a medium build, possibly 30-year-old blonde man. He wasn't covering his face or anything, but the thing is, he was carrying what looked like resistance bands or ropes. He sat in his car for about three minutes while I was on the phone with dispatch. Then he came back to our door and knocked hard for another few minutes. Dispatch advised me that police were on their way, and they hung up. I started videoing the vehicle. I read out the tag number, make and model, and just watched as he put his car in park and reverse over and over again. Out of seemingly nowhere, he backed out of the parking lot and started rushing away, but not before the officer arrived and pulled him over. My downstairs neighbor knocked on my door and told me that he had been peering into their little children's windows and was pounding on their door as well. She said that her husband had left only one minute before he started knocking at her door. She said he saw her children through the window, and that's why he continued knocking. Our doors are right next to one another, so he probably didn't know what door he had wanted opened. He was watching us as well through our upstairs windows, so I turned all the lights out and shut the blinds while I called dispatch. The police never contacted us for a statement. I've reached out to dispatch about an update, and I'm waiting to see if any action was taken. We're keeping our eyes peeled to see if he's been following us. I'm replacing my porch light bulbs with motion detectors and putting bars in our window and door tracks. My neighbor and our families are panicked to say the least. He was outside for about 25 to 30 minutes. To the knocking man with bad intentions, let's not meet. Update. I am trained in firearm usage and now live in a state where I can open carry and the background check is really quick. We're going this weekend to get a firearm. My husband will be taking some classes as he came from somewhere where owning a gun is illegal, so he's never handed one. I'm still waiting on a call from the responding officer. I have his badge number and name, so if they don't reach out to me today or tonight, he might be working third shift. I will call the substation. If they don't do anything, I will go ahead and make a suspicious person's case for the paper trail. We had no odd encounters last night. However, while I was looking at the video I took, I remember the car. I was walking my dog at 8 p.m. a week ago for him to pee, and this car was driving really slowly through my neighborhood parking lot and parked a few spots down from where I was letting my dog sniff. They just sat there with the car running. When I tell you my ears started ringing and I got an awful feeling, I'm not joking. I turned around and went home. Didn't give my dog much of a chance to pee, 
and shut every door and window. I think this man has been stalking out our apartment building, me and my neighbors. I think he wanted to get in where those children are. I'll update more when I have more information. Update 2. It's been a week since the incident. I called dispatch today because I never received a follow-up from the responding officer. A sergeant from the PT called me back to give me more information. He said that they pulled over the man, ran him to make sure that there were no warrants, and asked him what he was doing. He told the officer that he was meeting up with an acquaintance. The officer let him go with no further questions. Not only that, the responding officer is also a sergeant. I about lost my mind. The sergeant I spoke to today stated that he should have looked into it more. It was obviously an attempt at burglary, sexually motivated, and or with intent to commit a felony. The responding officer is supposed to call me tonight when he gets on duty. I'm livid, honestly. Zero due diligence for this case. But there's not even a case. No case number. Just a documented police contact. I'll give more info when I have it. Final update. The officer finally called me. Here's how the conversation went. Hello? I answered groggily as well as it was past midnight. Hello, miss. I was told you have some questions about an incident a few nights ago. Yes, about Thursday. I wanted to know what that man told you he was doing. You know he was looking in windows and carrying potential restraints. I'm not sure if that was relayed to you. I stopped him, ran his tags, and he told me that he was meeting up with a guy from a dating app. He seemed forthcoming and open with his motive for being there. Meeting up with... Wait. He was meeting up with someone by looking in windows, knocking on two different doors for 20 minutes. I was shocked and still not fully awake. Like I said, he seemed forthcoming and honest with me. When he said that, the first thing that popped to my mind was so was Jeffrey Dahmer. With resistance bands? Like workout bands? He had a lot of belongings in his car, so he probably just had them in there. Right. But bringing them to a hookup, knocking on multiple doors, he saw the little girls through the window. He waited until my neighbor's husband left until knocking. That's on tape, officer. I checked in with the apartment manager after the incident. Well, I'm familiar with this individual, and I've been doing drive throughs of your complex to make sure he doesn't come back. I haven't seen anything. If you don't have any more questions, I'll let you go, ma'am. Doesn't make sense to me, but thank you, goodbye. And I hung up. I don't have much to say. I just feel so icky about that conversation. Nothing new has come of the situation. I haven't seen the man or the car. My mind is blown at the lack of follow-up or due diligence. I live in a suburb. It's not a busy one either. The PD has a small jurisdiction. I guess I'll just have to protect myself. This happened several years ago. I was home alone one evening when I heard a knock at the back door. This confused me as no one ever used that door. My husband and I lived in a fourplex at the time, and all of the units had a back door at the top of a narrow staircase. These doors were a little inconvenient to access as you'd have to go around the building and up the narrow stairs, as opposed to the wider main entrance at the front. It didn't even make sense to use the back entrance, and I couldn't think of anyone who would go to that door to visit. As I approached the back door, I saw two tall men in the window, standing at the door. A chill went down my spine. I did not feel safe opening the door, so I called out. Hello? One of the men tapped on the window. Yes. Hello. May we come in? We're with Bresnan. At the time, my husband and I had Bresnan for cable, but did not have any issues with it. I replied, We're not having any issues with Bresnan. Is there a problem? Ma'am, the man said, can we come in? We're servicing the area and it's important we look at your cable. I shook my head. We're not having any issues, I repeated, so there's no need to stop by. Ma'am, we are visiting every resident. Let us in so we can do our job. I noticed the man grabbed the knob and tried to open the locked door. I slowly grabbed the knife from our knife block and held it at my chest. We're not having any issues, I repeated trying not to convey the shakiness of my voice. So you don't need to be here. 
The two figures appeared to shuffle and then straighten. Ma'am, let us in. We're on a deadline and need to do our job. I glanced at the clock, gauging when my husband would arrive from work. I gripped the knife tighter. Ma'am? Ma'am? I saw him try the doorknob again. I closed my eyes and felt overwhelming gratitude of always locking my doors. Just then, a thought came to the forefront of my mind. I'm sorry I can't help you. Can I please get your names and badge numbers? I can give your supervisor a call to let them know our cable is fine. I heard another shuffle and one man replied. No need to, ma'am. We're sorry we wasted your time. With that, both of the men exited the staircase and disappeared into the night. Shaken up, I held the knife tight and tried to get my bearings. I remember making a mental note to call the cable company or the police, but my hands were shaking so badly I couldn't hold my phone. With the knife still grasped to my chest and the phone falling out of my other hand, I sank to the floor and cried. When my husband returned home, I told him what had happened. I was still very shaken up and had started crying again after he got home. He immediately called the Bresden Cable Company and spoke to our representative who informed us that no one from their company was out on assignment in our area. The next day, we asked our neighbors if they had a visit from the company. No one had. So, to the two creepy men who tried to break into my home under the guise of cable repair, let's not meet. I work at a gas station on a main route. We see a lot of travelers passing through. Only one person works each shift, and it's a 24-hour store. We're short-staffed, so I agreed to an overnight. I am female. I work in a state that's always had self-serve gas stations. So this guy comes in. I ask him if he needs any help. He said no. He's getting gas at the pump, but needs to use the bathroom. I go back to work on whatever invoices we got yesterday. The guy uses the bathroom and then goes back outside. About five to seven minutes later, he comes back inside and tells me that he's confused about the pump. He directly says, you might have to come outside to help me. Customers don't often say this. They usually just complain that it's not working, so I'm already feeling weird about this guy. I shake it off because he looks like a nerd, and I don't feel afraid of him really. I look at the register to see what error it came up with for this pump, and there's no errors. The register doesn't even say it was in use. Even if someone tries to pay and nothing's wrong with their payment, it will at least say payment loyalty timed out, but literally, it had no sign of him trying to use it before I'm asking me for help. I ask him if he wants to just pay inside. He agrees to, gets his wallet out of his car, and then pays $10. I give him his receipt, and he says... Can you help me? I don't understand the machine. And I reply, We aren't really allowed to leave the store during overnight shifts, as it's just me in here and it's not safe to go outside. I don't know why I told him I was alone, but he wasn't seemingly threatening. He proceeds to say, I don't understand what it's asking me. I need help. I'm not scary. I tell him again that I can't go outside because it's a store policy for the overnight shift. And then I say, it's not that you're scary. I just can't go outside. I would have to tell a little old lady asking for help at this hour the same thing. Which is true. We can't even take out the trash during overnights. He starts to walk away from the register counter, but then again stops at the door and asks me one last time to come outside and help him. I'm pretty annoyed at this point. I've said no twice now. I'm not going, so stop asking. I finally say, in a super annoyed tone, Okay, all you need to do is one, pick up the nozzle, two, select fuel grade button, and three, put it in your tank and squeeze the little handle. I'm not going outside. Then he finally goes back to the car and the register tells me he had no trouble pumping gas. Also, his plates seem like they're from the state that I work in. This kind of thing wouldn't make me suspicious usually, but the fact that that he originally opted for me to go outside instead of bringing me money inside is weird. Along with how he didn't bother to use the pump before he came inside to ask for help, claiming it wasn't working and him not taking my first no for an answer. No means no. So, 
potential gas station abductor. Let's not meet again. I don't remember how old I was. Just that I was small enough to fit in the front baby seat of a grocery cart. That would put us in the late, very late 90s or the early 2000s. I was grocery shopping with my mom at Costco. For those who don't know the chain, it's basically a huge warehouse where everything is sold in bulk. Food, clothes, books. It's basically a Walmart. But if Walmart sold cereal boxes in counts of threes or frozen dinners by the dozen. My mom has a habit of pulling her grocery cart down to one side of the aisle in stores and then walking the length of the shelves, picking what she wants, and then coming back to the cart and dumping what she has in the basket. I don't get why she does it, but hey, moms do weird things. So, I'm maybe four or five years old, sitting in the front basket, playing with my Game Boy Color, when she pulls over to a fruit stand in Costco and tells me that she's going to look at the different deals and to sit tight. I wasn't a very fidgety kid, so I said no problem. She's gone for a couple of minutes. I'm absorbed in Pokemon, so I didn't really notice her walk up until the cart starts moving. Being a kid, I instinctively trust that she's the one pushing the cart. I was wrong. After a moment or two, I catch out of the corner of my vision her red nails. This is a problem because my mom never paints her nails and never, ever wears them long. I look up. The lady pushing the cart is a little older than my mother. Same curly black hair, but pulled into a ponytail at the nape of her neck. I still remember she had tanned, Italian-type skin with thick red lips, a heavy coat of eyeliner, and brown eyes. She was pretty skinny. Her teeth were yellowed and she smelled like what I didn't realize until later. Bad B.O. This wasn't my mom and I said so very loudly. She laughed and looked around and pushed the cart a little faster. I said it again and she looked me dead in the eyes and said, Oh sweetie, what game are you playing? I am your mom. So the way Costco is set up, at least ours, is that in the produce area, Instead of aisles, they're more like islands. They're huge square setups that you can see the entire length of the produce section if you walk in that area. So, of course, I can see my actual mother a few displays away. As loud as I could, I remember yelling, Mom! And watching her head whip around to look at me, right as this lady is trying to cover my mouth with her hand. I don't know if she decided then that I wasn't worth it because I was too noisy. Or... If she saw my mother charging from a few displays over. A side note. My mom is not a petite woman. She's built like a linebacker and played roller derby and softball throughout college. Up until I was about 10. She's more of an ox than a human woman. But that's what I appreciate about her. But anyways. This woman squeezed her hand around my little face once and then booked it. My mom comes running up to me and starts asking me a million questions at once. And my little brain thinks all of a sudden that I'm in trouble for using my outdoor voice inside because she looks mad. So I start to cry. By the time she calmed me down, the lady was already gone and reporting her to the head of security did bup kiss. Store never found her inside and security cam footage shows her leaving but never with anyone else. I don't know why she picked me or what it would have been for. But I'm just glad that my real mom ended up scaring her away. And that nothing became of this attempted kidnapping. I was 12 years old, and my older sister and I were home alone for the weekend. I was waiting for a friend to pick me up and getting restless. There was a knock on the door. Thinking it was her, I ran to answer it without checking through the peephole. A man was standing there with a clipboard and said he needed to check our gas meter. I was entrenched in the disappointment of my friend still not having arrived 
So I just told him, yeah, sure, whatever you need to do. I didn't notice at the time that he wasn't dressed as a city official. He had on a green and purple shirt with bold stripes like the host of Blue's Clues. He came in and immediately went up the stairs to where our bedrooms were and walked into the open door of my room, the typical girly girl room with pink and glitter. Thank God my sister came down the stairs at almost that exact same moment. She said, oh, is that Daphne's dad? Why is he going upstairs? And I complained about how Daphne wasn't here and was going on and on about how unreliable she was when my sister cut me off. Wait, wait. If Daphne isn't here, who is that? I said, he's here to read the gas meters. Her face turned white. She flung open the front door and dragged me out, hand clamped over my protesting mouth. She said, our gas meters are outside. Neither of us had a cell phone. This happened in the 60s. And obviously, we weren't going back in the house to call authorities on the landline phone. Then, my ever-resourceful sister had a stroke of genius. A man was walking right by our house, and she motioned him over. She called loudly into the house. Oh, Dad, it's good you're home. A man from the city is here to read the gas meters upstairs. Just like she'd hoped, this man on the street said, What are you talking about? The man in the striped shirt bolted out of the house. The man on the street asked us repeatedly if we were okay, if we needed him to stay and wait in the yard with us until our parents came home. He was very sweet. We were so startled that we barely thanked him before slamming and locking the doors and windows. As irate as my sister was that I let someone in the house, she begged me not to call the authorities because my parents left her in charge and she'd worried that she'd be in trouble. I didn't want to catch any heat from carelessly allowing some guy in, so I was on the same page. Three weeks later, a girl in our community went missing. Same M.O. She was home alone and authorities found the door open and no signs of forced entry. My sister and I discussed our options, but deep down, we knew we had no choice but to come clean. We told the police everything. I don't know if it ever helped, but they did tell us they had reason to believe it was the same man. They also tracked down the man who helped us on the street. Turns out, we already knew him. He worked in the butcher shop. We just didn't recognize him. He was lifelong friends with the family after that. Our parents were mortified. They weren't angry with us, just glad we were okay. Though they did review all the rules of caution and didn't leave us home alone for a while. They found the girl and say she'd been held for a few days and then burned alive. They never caught the man, but fear not. He was in what appeared to be his early 30s in the 1960s. So in any case, he has to be dead by now. I just thank God every day for my sister's resourcefulness and quick action. This happened a couple of years ago when I was a senior in high school living in Southern California. It was later in the evening, sometime between 8 or 8.30, and my mom and I had just gotten home from a long day of driving and visiting family to discover that our cat was completely out of food. I was tired of being in the car by then and did not want to go to Petco to get cat food. My mom begged me to go with her, so I finally caved and said yes. Looking back now, I am so grateful that I did, because if I hadn't decided to go, I think there's a good chance my mom would have never come home. Another important detail that I want to mention is that the windows on my car my mom had were extremely tinted, making it pretty much impossible to see into the car. So we pull into the parking lot of Petco, and I look around and notice there's only a few other cars with one parked a few rows to the back of us. My mom says I can wait in the car since she's going in real quick to pick up food. A minute later, my mom walks out of the car and is halfway to the store. The car that's parked a few rows back pulls up into the spot right next to our car on the passenger side. I think it's a little strange, but I think maybe the person wanted a closer spot to the store. 
a man steps out of the car and gets his big German shepherd out of the back of his car and walks into the store. I'm looking inside the store and notice this guy is watching my mom and following her around, but not enough for her to notice. He gets ahead of her in line, and after he checks out, he stands outside the entrance and is watching her check out. My mom walks out of the store and the guy starts walking behind her. At this point, I'm starting to get a really bad feeling and I'm very creeped out. When my mom makes it back to our car, she opens the back to put cat food in and the guy opens the back of his car right next to ours and starts talking to her and motioning for her to come look at something in the back of his car. My mom, being completely oblivious, takes a few steps over and is looking into the back of his car. His hands start to move towards his waist and I immediately start yelling for her to get into our car right now. The guy looks super shocked as I'm guessing he never saw me in the car and stops talking to her. My mom looks very confused, but after I yell at her some more to get into the car, she finally does. The creepy guy immediately gets into his car and drives off in a hurry. When my mom gets into the car, I ask her what the guy was saying to her, and she tells me he was trying to get her to look at something he got for his dog that was in the back of his car. I tell her everything I observed, and that I'm pretty sure that he was trying to abduct her. This happened a few months ago in the McDonald's at Copenhagen Station. I'm not Danish, only visiting the country for a single day, and since I wanted to travel cheap, I decided to take the cheapest bus there, which just so happened to be the one arriving at 11 p.m. the day before. I thought I could save even more money by not renting a bed somewhere and instead spending the night awake or half asleep at the station, do my business the next day, and sleep long and well on the bus back home. So this McDonald's is open 24-7. I pretty early discovered that the station was too cold for me to get some shut-eye. So I went inside and bought a coffee and sat down at an empty table. Plenty of lighting and semi-drunk people to keep me awake, I thought. I should add, I'm a 23-year-old female. After a while of sitting in my spot, a strange guy walked over and placed a full cup of soda on my table. He said in Danish something I believe meant, I ate my food already. I didn't drink any. You should have it instead. I'm Swedish, and although some Swedes understand Danish perfectly well, I have some difficulties doing so, so this is just a guess. Anyway, I didn't really pay much attention to the cup after it was put on my table, just wrote it off as a random drunk guy trying to flirt. But I noticed that in front of me, a table away, sat another guy, and he was watching me closely, because we did lock eyes the times I looked up to peek at him. This creeped me out. I really didn't like being watched like this, and he just sat there for nearly an hour, even though he had no food in front of him. In the end, this dude stood up and walked over to me, and I cursed internally, thinking I'd have to defend myself and tell him to leave. But he turned, and there stood the guy that had left the soda cup on my table. He told the soda guy to leave after pushing the soda cup back into his arms, and that he didn't want to see him anywhere near this place again. Then, he turned to me and explained in English, that soda guy had walked by my table several times glancing at me, and the cup, and probably waiting for me to drink it. He said he'd finished his meal a while ago and just stayed to watch over me, but had to leave and reminded me to be careful. I hadn't even noticed the soda guy supposedly pacing by. I was too fixated on this other dude, who just so happened to be the good guy watching over me. And who knows what was in that soda? And what would have happened should I had gotten really thirsty and drank some of it? So thank you, McDonald's guy who watched over me. My name is Corey, spelled C-O-R-I, not C-O-R-Y, not C-O-R-E-Y. C-O-R-I, a usually feminine spelling of a name for a guy. Not that I mind much of what spelling or so on of what my parents gave me. 
a few years ago, I had just been let go from my first job out of college. It had been pretty good money, but the company went under. So I started applying to every job I could find as you do. Indeed, Monster, even Craigslist. One Craigslist job in particular was based on the outskirts of the city that I lived in, but I was ready to take anything. The job in question was some basic data entry and assistant work. At least that had been what the job listing said. I thought it was on the up and up, however, because this was one of the few Craigslist postings that had a website attached to it. It was a pretty basic website in retrospect, but the company message seemed to make it sound like they were heavy about serving the city and facilitating volunteer work. Within minutes of applying, I got a response inviting me for an interview that same day, though it titled me as Miss Corey. I was going to respond to correct them, but it read that it was an automated response, so there would be no one to read it. I figured I'd just have to correct them once I got there. And again, it didn't seem like that big of a deal. I'd gotten this once or twice before. I drove to the location that the company website listed, and it didn't seem too out of the ordinary. It was the second floor of a small building that was sandwiched in between a pawn shop and a phone store. I didn't think too much of it because this was a big city, and even if this is on the outskirts of that city, a job was a job. I looked up to the second floor of the outside, and saw someone looking down at me. I couldn't make out the face, but it was a person. That much I'm sure of. I went inside of the building and took the elevator up to the second floor and didn't find a single soul. It looked like a half-finished office floor from what I remember, with some doors opened and some locked shut, but there was simply no one to speak to, no one to inform that I was there. There was one cubicle, but one of the detachable walls had been left in another office room. There was a computer monitor in one room, but no desktop attached to it. A half-finished company banner and a bookcase. On closer inspection of the bookcase, all the books weren't books, but they were cardboard printings of a bunch of books stacked together. I finally had too much and called the phone number that had been on the website, but I heard no phone ringing from where I stood. More so, The phone I called seemed to cut my call after a ring and a half, sending me straight to voicemail. Sufficiently creeped out by now, or wondering if I had stumbled on something that I shouldn't have, I took the elevator down. As the elevator doors closed, I heard someone muttering angrily. I thought that was a girl's name. I didn't want to stay to find out who said it. Instead, I walked right back to my car and drove back home. Not even daring to look back up at the window of the floor, I was sure that I had been scheduled for. That very evening, out of morbid curiosity, I checked Craigslist. The posting was gone. I looked for the website. It has been disabled. To this day, I wonder what or who did I stumble on. And my greatest regret is not calling the police about this. This happened when I was around 17 years old, and is still happening now. At 17, I felt lost in the world, and stuck in a job that I disliked with work colleagues that didn't like me. This had to do with my accent, as I was quite well-spoken, so they thought that I was a rich kid. It all started on a Friday after work. The factory I worked in had a half day on Fridays, so I would just spend the rest of the day wandering around the city that I lived in. It had been a tough day of relentless mocking, and I was reaching my breaking point. I went around the city looking for a new job. I visited the police recruitment center, the army, navy and air force centers, and even the International Red Cross. I just wanted to get away from it all. After a few hours, I had a bag full of career pamphlets, and still no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I turned a corner and immediately saw a sign sitting in front of me. I can remember it so vividly now. It said, Free personality test. Are you curious about yourself? Come in. I then looked up at the building, and in a big fancy sign, outside, it said, The Church of Scientology. Now before I continue, 
Yes, I already knew about Scientology. However, I had a morbid curiosity about it. I had heard all the horror stories and goings on inside the church, but Tom Cruise was my favorite actor, and he seemed to have his life all sorted out pretty good. My famous last words right there. So, I went inside. I was immediately greeted by a very nice lady. She asked me how I was doing and what she could do for me today. I asked if I could speak to someone about the church and the personality test. She smiled and said, I would be happy to. Please take a seat and I will get someone to speak right to you. After a minute, I was introduced to an older man named Alan, and he was the head of my city's Scientology Center. Alan took me to a small room to talk privately. When we entered, I immediately noticed the large picture of L. Ron Hubbard on the wall. We sat down and genially had a nice talk. I told him about how I was upset about where my life was going. I told him about how I wanted to leave, plus all the trouble that I was having at work. He seemed genuinely concerned for me, and I felt like he wanted to help. After a while of talking, I agreed to do the personality test. He gave me the test and left the room, saying to give the test to the receptionist after I had finished. Two hours later, I finished it. I'm not joking. That's how long it took. It was around 500 questions about anything and everything. I handed it in to the receptionist, and she told me it would take some time to process. In the meantime, Alan had told her to take me to their private cinema to show me a film. I thought it was just going to be some old room in the back with a TV on the wall. But no, they indeed have a private cinema. It could seat around 50 people and had a large screen in the front. It did feel a bit weird just sitting by myself in a cinema owned by Scientology, but I bet that hasn't happened to many people. Maybe it has. Anyway, I sat down and they played me the film. It was about 30 minutes long and consisted of a narrator explaining these strange feelings you sometimes get, with some mediocre acting following along. I remember a section about how much you doubt yourself, knowing you have a locked door but going back to check it multiple times. At one point, the film showed how a past event that happened to your mother while she was pregnant with you could affect your life in a negative way. For example, your mother was sick on a flight, so you're afraid of flying. I also vaguely remember something about rotten eggs and how much an event involving them can hurt you. I know it sounds absurd, but in some ways, the film really made sense to me at the time. When the film was done, I was taken to Alan's office and he told me my results. He told me I was extremely depressed, one of the most unmotivated people that he had even met, lacking cognitive thinking and I was a waste of talent. Now this made me very upset, but Alan said he could help me. He gave me about four books and a DVD. He told me to read the books and watch the film before my course. I asked, what course? And Alan told me he had signed me up to do a course at the center. He convinced me that if I didn't do this course, that my life would soon spiral out of control. He made me hand over quite a lot of money for the course and said I would receive an email about the course, which was in a month's time. I left the center, ran home, and immediately started reading the books that I was given. This happened all over the weekend. I had basically locked myself in my room and did nothing but read and reread those books and watch the DVD over and over again. Over the next week, I began taking notes about myself and my family. I emailed Alan about questions and concerns. I started resenting my mother for my life. I began to think she was the problem, that everything bad that happened to me was the result of her. I started to treat her badly, swearing at her, and did the best that I could to ignore her. When I emailed Alan about my mother, he told me that if she was the catalyst for my problems, then maybe I should consider disconnecting from her and I took that seriously I made plans to totally leave her out of my life a week before my course I developed some kind of god complex towards everyone around me what I read in those books told me what I could become I saw everyone in my family as below me I really became a truly spiteful person just days before my course I was confronted by my mother and father they said they were concerned about me and they searched my room my dad took out all my Scientology books in the DVD. I was outraged. I screamed and cursed at my parents. 
I said horrible and wicked things to them. I told them how I was going to leave them and how I never wanted to see them again. Hours of arguing back and forth, tears and crying. However, in the end, they did convince me that the church was a bad place. They said, if I was so miserable at work, I should have told them. And that is true. To this day, I can't believe I didn't say anything to them. Instead, I went to Scientology. That night, after the arguing had stopped, they sat me down and comforted me. I really couldn't believe it. After the way that I had treated them for the past three weeks, they still cared for me. The next day, I emailed Alan and told him that I would not be coming back to the church. He quickly got back to me asking why, asking if it was my family and if I was being forced to not go. However, I ignored him. The emails I received in the next few weeks were mad. He told me stuff like, I should leave my family now and I could stay at the church. He tried to convince me that it was all because of my mother. He even emailed me to say something along the lines of, he won't be surprised if he read in the papers that I was found dead by suicide. I'm very sure he crossed the line there, but I just kept ignoring him. The strangest email I got was one in all binary code. 00110011 this and 10001010110 that. I used a binary code translator, but it all came back as mixed up letters and numbers. None of it made sense. Eventually, I blocked him. However, it still hasn't stopped. About two or three times a year, I'll get an email from the church. It's either asking how I am or asking about my family. When I get them, I immediately block the email address. But they just keep coming. It's always someone new, saying they heard about my case and were worried about me. The whole reason I'm writing this is because I just got one the other day, and I thought it might make a good warning. Please, I beg of you, do not go to the Church of Scientology Center. If they can make me into a spitefully degenerate in just a few hours, what can they do with a person in a few months or even a year? If someone has any idea how to block an entire religion or cult from my email, then please let me know. And if you are lost in life, sad or upset, then please, please talk to your family friends, or a doctor. When you're down, don't let others make you into a monster. Take it from me. After this event, I got help, and I'm a happy and confident person now.